this. All right, can you guys hear us? Perfect, good. This is Michael Huerta. He's the former administrator from the FAA. I'm gonna finish, let this guy finish his call. Uh, so we're gonna get to the bottom of aliens, what we're gonna do right now. He's gonna tell us if aliens are real and if they're flying around. Do you have that, do you, do you know that or? There are a lot of things flying around. <laughs> okay. What we're really gonna talk about is um, flight in cities. And the first thing I wanna start with, and this is something near and dear to my heart, I wanna talk a little bit about quadcopters, licenses, uh, and what it's, it's gonna mean once we start using these things for more than just toys. Uh, if you wanna talk a little about your experience with that. You know, drones are probably the next big revolution in aviation. You know, as we were uh, getting ready, uh, one of the things that John mentioned is we've been flying around in largely the same airplanes since the Wright brothers. Uh, there have been changes. Yes, we have the jet engine, which was really the last big revolution. But now just, you know, a couple of things that indicate how quickly this is growing. We have on the aircraft registry of the United States, that's kind of like the DMV for airplanes, 320,000 airplanes. And that includes commercial planes, general aviation, uh, aircraft, everything. It took us 100 years to get there. We have had a registry for drones in the United States for about two and a half years, and we have over a million registered on that. Now, granted, a lot of those are the hobbyist drones that uh, kids might use to take pictures or what have you, but we have more drones registered to carry out commercial activities, surveys or uh, inspections, what have you, than we have commercial aircraft registered in the United States. And so things are changing and they're changing very, very fast. You know, there's a lot of talk about uh, drone taxis, about drone delivery services, and those are raising some really important questions for cities as to how do we deal with that and what does that mean in terms of how we fit all of this stuff into what is a very crowded sky. So what is the real, so first off, why would I as a, as a hobbyist need to register my drone? Should I do that to help you guys out, to help the FAA out? Should I do that for legality's sake? Is there any specific reason why I'm doing it? And this is for my own edification. The principal reason that uh, we ask you to register your drone is so that we can establish a relationship between the operator and the user. In the course of registering, you can do it online on the FAA's website, what, there are rules of the road. There's kind of an educational purpose that it serves. You know, reminding you, don't fly it within five miles of an airport. Don't fly it off the end of runways. Don't fly it uh, in certain areas that might represent security risks. And then it also educates you, educates you on the, the rules of the sky. You have a responsibility as a pilot to look out for other aircraft and to make sure that you don't create a safety situation. So the purpose is primarily educational. From the standpoint of our partners in national security and police departments, they also want to really have a sense of who is out there and to establish a relationship with them. This is all part of creating a legal framework for drones, because if you have a legal framework for drones, then it's much easier to determine when something is, is happening that is not legal. What, what does the world look like in 20 years in terms of aviation? Are we stuck in the, the re recombination of a Wright Brothers era airplane, or what's gonna change over the next 20 years? Well, let's talk about a couple of things. Uh, there's been, you know, those of us of a certain age remember TV, a TV show called The Jetsons, and uh, there was uh, something that looked like these flying taxis that would carry a couple of people. I think the drone taxi is not that far off. I really think that uh, we're going to see examples of that in regular service probably within five years. Now, that raises a lot of really significant questions. You know, the first question is, Okay, well, where do they take off and land? You know, today, we all know where the airport is or the airports here in New York. But you have to establish what are areas where you allow these uh, aircraft to pick up, 
and drop off people. What are the routes that they fly in the sky? You know, the most efficient one is point to point, you know, a straight line. That's always the shortest distance between two points. But if you're flying at relatively low altitudes, there are all the things that come with low altitude flight. Noise and uh, disruption of, uh, you know, your activities. Let's say you're having a backyard barbecue. Do you really want things flying low over your backyard? A mayor that I talked to put it this way. You know, he, he made the point that uh, under current law, anything that flies is exclusively regulated by the FAA here in the United States. But there is also an exclusive authority that a mayor has for zoning and the use of property. And there is a right that a property owner has for quiet enjoyment of the airspace over their property. So you can see there's a gray area where all of that stuff comes together. And uh, my mayor friend put it this way, if I have a citizen in my city that is, wants to complain about their neighbor getting packages delivered by drone at all hours of the day and night, or about drone taxis overflying their house, they're not gonna call the FAA. They're gonna call the mayor. And so the real question becomes, that he was asking is, what are my rights as a mayor, and how do we establish what the rules are between what you and the federal level are going to regulate versus what I at the city level have the authority to have some control over? And so this is only one of the many policy questions that we need to sort out. What else is there? What else do we have to sort out? Because it sounds like this, um, it's almost a non-starter to a degree, the way that the way you just described it. Is there hope for this technology? Have you seen anything that's that's potentially could solve this problem without without uh, going through all the interim steps of having like a noisy drone? Yeah, there there are a bunch of things that are going on. The FAA has uh, about a dozen certification projects underway right now for aircraft. There's a lot of uh, unmanned aircraft. And there are, there's a lot of experimentation with electric propulsion, um, different designs that uh, greatly reduce the noise footprint. Just today, uh, the FAA, in conjunction with the Department of Transportation, also announced a pilot project where they have designated 10 cities around the country to experiment. They can uh, try out different regulatory structures. They can try out uh, technological solutions uh, that, for example, might restrict drones from flying in particular places where they shouldn't be. Or they can experiment with certain types of operations, operations beyond visual line of sight, operations beyond, or, uh, beyond daylight hours. And the purpose of all of this is that uh, what the agency is trying to get to is to develop data based on these pilots that would enable them to figure out how to solve some of these problems. You know, the more traditional government way of doing that would be a rulemaking process, but this is an innovative, fast-moving industry, and I think what they're trying to do is to come up with a framework where they can try a whole lot of things at once and then use the data derived from that to define what a future state might look like. During your time at the FAA, was there any moment where you saw things change almost overnight uh, in a similar way? Was it, a, is it, at the FAA, is it a slow process? Or are there things that come up that basically change all the rules at once? You know, um, I think this is an example of one that's changing the rules all at once. Because it's, it's fundamentally redefining what we mean when we talk about aviation and aerospace. You know, we've had a clear sense in our mind of what aviation has been for a very, very long time. But you know, think about it, you know, I talked about those one million registrants against the 300,000. Those are all people that are brand new to aviation. And it, it's a very different culture than we have in aviation. And aviation is characterized by a safety culture. It is by far the safest mode of transportation. And uh, it has been through a lot of hard work of a lot of people over many years. 
the problem with a safety culture, though, is that it's a very cautious culture. No one wants to be the one that changes the rules and messes that up and results in you know, anything that would degrade the safety of aviation. The drone industry comes out of the Silicon Valley culture, which is a culture of get something out in the marketplace as fast as you can and improve it uh, you know, later. Think about it, uh, you get a new iPhone and you turn it on, what's the first thing it does? It, da it downloads a bunch of patches. Okay, so basically, we're all beta testers. You know, when we buy an iPhone or we buy, uh, you know, an iPad, we're all a bunch of beta testers. Nobody wants beta testers flying around in the sky around airplanes. And so, you know, I, I think it is important just to understand and respect that these are very different cultures. And I don't think one needs to change, but everyone needs to understand where the other is coming from. I think that, uh, you know, this is... A, just a fundamental change though, but it has great potential because it's bringing a lot of innovation into aviation. The same work that's being done in electric propulsion systems for drones has applications in more traditional aircraft. Uh, new materials, lighter materials, smaller aircraft, I think all of that, you know, there's a lot of crossover between what's happening there and in what we think of as traditional aviation. So I guess this is, this could be a two-parter. How does, how would we fix uh, commercial aviation, uh, passenger aviation, uh, given that safety bias? And also, how does a small startup sort of break into the industry? Uh, we can assume there are plenty of startups walking around trying to figure out how to fix things for cities. How do they break into the industry without A, being uh, litigated out of existence for doing something weird, or B, uh, stepping on toes? Well, you know, let, let's take that piece first. The, the startups, um, I think, uh, do have a very open ear on the part of the, agent, the FAA and our government partners to figure out uh, how we can work with them. One of the things that I think um, has been a very, very good development is that the FAA has developed a very open and transparent process for pulling together advisory committees. And they have really tried to focus on bringing in those startups to try to help them figure out what do we need to create in terms of a regulatory environment that will foster that innovation and find that right balance between safety, efficiency, and at the same time, fostering innovation. And it's not easy. Y you know, you think about it, um, let's, let's just talk about the drone taxi as one example. Aviation traditionally relies on two types of certifications to ensure safety. One is the certification of the operator, so that would be the airline, the pilot, what have you. The other is the certification of the aircraft to ensure that uh, there's redundancy and adequate systems to ensure a level of safety. In the drone world, the focus up until now has been entirely on the operator. You know, the, uh, are they operating in a safe way? What is the basic licensing requirement for the pilot? But now everyone's having to struggle with the question of the certification of the aircraft. Uh, there's been a conference going on in LA this week uh, hosted by Uber, Uber Elevate, which is really starting to struggle with this question. And the question they're asking is, if we are going to certify the aircraft, to what standard? Think about it. You know, your average, you know, your aircraft standard is, for certification, is very, very high. We have had, since 2009, in commercial aviation, one fatality. Conversely, on our nation's highways, about 40,000 people die annually in crashes uh, on our nation's highways. Now, if the drone taxi is going to take people off of the highways, do you establish a different standard for certifying those special purpose aircraft? 
And those are the kinds of things that we have to grapple with, but we have to do it collaboratively between government and industry to figure that out. And what should cities be doing right now to prepare for this? Is there anything they can be doing, or should they start talking to you? Well, I, th I actually think they should talk to each other. There is a lot of really interesting work that is going on in cities all around um, the U.S. as they try to grapple with these questions. Uh, the Conference of Mayors has been active in working with the agency on framing out what um, new drone regulations should look like. There have been a couple of mayors that have been active participants, and they talk very, uh, you know, very openly with mayors all around the country and around the world. The other thing they need to be doing is bringing forward what are their concerns. Like, for example, um, I talked about the zoning rights that a city has, and those um, are something you know that clearly at the federal level. The FAA doesn't think a lot about, you know, of how to re re how, how you work within that framework, except contractually, as we do with airports today. Another big issue for cities is privacy. If you have a lot of drones that are flying over um, a city, doing site surveys, aerial surveillance, you generate a lot of public concern about what exactly are these things surveying? How, is that infringing on my right to privacy as, as a citizen? And what are authorities doing about that to make sure that they can protect you know, uh, our, something that we very much cherish in this country, our right to privacy? And so I think that cities need to be very active in that conversation. As they start to think about uh, programs like delivery services, I think they are gonna need to grapple with the question of do they wanna have designated zones, designated hours, or do they want it to be completely free and open um, over their cities? And there are a lot of trade-offs that need to be made publicly in terms of how they think about all that stuff. So they wanna be open, they wanna be in touch with the people that live in their cities and uh, with the businesses that operate there and figure out what are some basic frameworks that they can get comfortable with that balance all those equities and then share that broadly with other cities. We only have about two minutes. What happens first? An Amazon delivery drone that drops off my packages or a Uber taxi, flying taxi? Oh, I think the Amazon, well, let's just say the delivery drone. Uh, there are, right now there are a lot of experimental programs uh, that are taking place with designations from the FAA. You can order fast food at Virginia Tech and have it delivered by drone. Uh, there are, um, as part of the pilot programs uh, that were announced today, uh, many of the cities are going to be experimenting with different types of deliveries, some for life-saving equipment and others for supplies. And so uh, you're going to be seeing that very, very soon. And when, we're, when are we going to see the Uber taxi? Because I want to fly over the traffic back home. You know, I think that um, you'll see it in s to some degree within five years. Um, I don't think it'll be widely uh, deployed at that point, but um, I think certainly within the next five years, you're going to see some good examples of that. Right, very cool. It's a pity we didn't get to go into the UFOs that you wanted to talk about, but that's all right. We didn't know about that. Michael Huerta, uh, former administrator for the FAA. This has been amazing. Thank you for this. Thank you. Thanks.